Welcome back to the Midweek Bible Study. I'm so glad you're with us. <clears throat> we are in Titus chapter 2 as we walk our way through the Bible, through the New Testament, in the order in which the books were written. We're going to start, uh, we've been right in the middle of uh, being given rules of behavior that Titus was to take with him into the insane culture of the island of Crete. At that time, um, Crete was rather like one of the um, you know, pirate strongholds in the Caribbean and that women were not safe, but women were loose and licentious. The men were uh, rapacious. They were um, drunkards a lot. And it was just, it was an insane area. And Titus was going in there because there were believers who lived on Crete and they needed to find a way to live and organize that would protect them and would keep them from falling victim to the culture and becoming a part of the culture or uh, becoming a victim to the culture by living their lives in opposition to the culture rather than in service to Christ. Please remember there is a very big difference there. There's a difference between opposing evil and and, and that's it, that's all you do. And following Christ. Because if you oppose evil and that's all you do, it's easy to become evil in the opposition to evil. But following Christ will teach you when to be loving, when to serve, when to do what. And so that's what Paul is trying to bring to the island of Crete through this pretty tough young man named Titus. Last week, We've already walked our way through instructions to older men, older women, and younger women. Now he's gonna to talk to the young men, and then we're gonna hit a couple of spots that are gonna be rough, all right? So Titus chapter two, verse uh, six. Is that where I wanna be? Yeah, verse six. Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. Again, if you were to go through this book and circle every time it was self-controlled, disciplined, where a person was not to rely upon an outside agency, like laws, or the shaming of culture in the neighborhood, the shunning of your cultural group, but rather you choose the way you behave, you control yourself. It is amazing how many times that shows up in Titus, because the answer to what was going on in Crete was not some top-down establishment of law. It was not some law dictated from on high and, and political circles that said you do this, you do this, you do that. That would never bring about the kind of people that Jesus wants. It has to arise from within, from your spirit agreeing with the Holy Spirit and living a particular kind of life. So self-controlled. In everything, set them an example by doing what is good. So Titus is to show them how to do good. And that's a heavy, heavy weight for any young man, any old man. I mean, I'm aware that wherever I go, people recognize me. I've been recognized in hotels in far off states. I've been recognized on cruise ships in the middle of the ocean. Uh, it is, um, it's rather humbling, a little frightening, but it reminds me that I live in a fish bowl and I need to always be behaving well. Do I always behave well? Of course I do. No, I don't. Most of the time, yeah. But I, I hope that I'm getting better. I hope I'm drawing closer to Christ. Because uh, again, you just never know, right? In your teaching, show integrity. Um, by the way, integrity, integral, integrate. It just means that what you, what you say you believe, the faith that you pros uh, profess, matches the way you speak, the way you do business, the way you treat people. So they have to be integral. They have to work together like gears meshing well. Seriousness, and again, it was a party, wild carousing island. You're to be serious. Soundness of speech that cannot be condemned, and this is really important, that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Once again, the reputation of God is a huge motivation that should drive our behavior. We don't wanna drag God's reputation down 
Therefore, we live lives that will elevate his reputation. Uh, the, for the Jews throughout history, that was a really big motivation. And it is to be a big motivation in a Christian life as well. <clears throat> now, we're gonna talk about slaves again. And I must, once again, remind you that our Monday morning messages, I think there are four, maybe even six, but we looked at slavery in the Bible. And so you can go back and look at those. We mentioned it very briefly um, back in Timothy and also during our, our looks through, through Peter. But the Monday morning messages is where you want to want to go to really unfold this. Once again, Paul could not make any secular law. He could not overthrow any secular law. You were not allowed to release a slave. If you did, you became a slave in many of these places. Uh, but it was not allowed in any place. The secular authorities were hard on that. So in Christianity, we were told then to treat the slaves as if they are our brothers and sisters, exactly as we treat the rest of our family that they are to be basically adopted. Since we can't release them, they are now family. Uh, and by the way, that happened quite a lot. There are records of slaves becoming family members, inheriting, uh, carrying on the family business and the family name. So Christians handled it different, but you could not have a, a rule made by Paul or anyone else that said, right Christians, free your slaves they would have uh, the slaves would have been uh, killed in prison sold off someone else and the christians would have uh, had the same fate so it is not as simple as people try to make it <clears throat> verse 9 teach slaves to be subject to their masters and everything to try to please them not to talk back to them not to steal from them but to show that they can be fully trusted so that in and here again why so that in every way they will make the teaching about God, our Savior, attractive. There are quite enough letters and uh, text from, not like phone text, but you know, on walls and, and papyrus and the like. We know that Romans learned to, uh, to love the Christians who were slaves because they were honest and they didn't steal and they didn't rise up and kill. And so they, they ended up treating the Christians as a special class, even within the slaves. And again, all of this is repugnant to us, but this was the reality in which they lived and no Christian would be able to change it for someone else, but for their family, kind of like Joshua would say uh, a long time before this time, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, these are no longer slaves. They are brothers and sisters, and we're going to treat them accordingly. But if you didn't have a believing master, but you were a Christian, you were to make sure that no matter what you did, you did not bring disrepute upon the name of God. So you were to behave in a way that elevated God's reputation on that island. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. He's talking here about slaves and talking about new Christians, but then talking about masters who are not slaves. And he's talking about all these things. And in the middle of it, Paul says something which should make us jerk back and have a look. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Now, I've had this explained away my entire life. That no, 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 few there be that find it. And again, I think that was a misunderstanding, not finding, Christ, not finding salvation, but finding the Jesus way of walking. Um, but here, it was explained away as, well, it has appeared, but not all people have accepted it. Well, that's demonstrably untrue. There are many, there are white swaths of humanity that never heard the name of Jesus, never heard anything about this. So they never, that does not work. You cannot use that for this. Now others will say, well, it's, um, <clears throat> it just means that it's out there and eventually it'll, per no, it says has. This is one of the many passages that makes me think God's gonna save a lot more people than we've ever imagined. 
I always say I'm a hopeful universalist. In other words, I'm not a universalist, but I'm leaning that way because passages like this cannot be explained away without doing utter violence to the passage. And Paul here is saying, even on Crete, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared. We just need to help them understand it's a reality. Now, if you're not aware of this, um, you need to be. For years and years and years, it was believed that heaven was somewhere off in space, that it was, a, it was an actual physical locality. Well, now we know enough about the universe to know, well, no, it's, it, it had to be a spiritual reality if it's out there. Not that we've mapped the universe by any stretch, but the universe is a lot bigger than people realized it was. And a teaching has arisen, which has a lot of spiritual support. Great people like John Mark Hicks, um, Bobby Valentine, N.T. Wright, we could go on and on, have said that our job is to redeem the earth because heaven will be a redeemed earth. I don't really know how all that works, frankly. Either way, the spiritual reality or the redeemed earth. I, and I refuse to fight on either side of this. But verses like this make me think redeemed earth has a lot closer, it's a lot closer to reality than I had thought. So, um, for example, here, what are, what are these people supposed to be doing on Crete? They are supposed to be living the reality of the risen Lord and living that story, even if they can't tell it, living that story before the others to redeem the island one observer at a time. That sounds a lot like a redeemed earth. But regardless, it makes me feel proud of God. Um, I've, I've always loved him and feared him, always wanted to obey him and please him. But here, you can actually smile and say, our God is so big that he loves these Cretans. Even though Paul has some rough things to say about them, God offered them grace just as Jesus did while on the cross to those crucified with him and to those who were crucifying him. Our God's love is bigger than any of us have ever imagined. And we serve that God. Wow. So this grace, verse 12, he says, teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, the word again, upright and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope the glorious appearing of our great god and savior jesus christ who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own eager to do what is good wow this just really backs up everything we've just said and everything paul said obviously we live a life that is marked by a skill that the world does not have. The ability to say no. Think about that. It is one of the most powerful things we can do. No is a spiritual word. No is a complete sentence. It does not need to be defended. We can say no. Uh, I, it, you could be a young person being offered drugs. And it was, it was ridiculed when Nancy Reagan said, just say no, because it was a bit more complicated than that. But she tried her best, and the fact is, you can say no. And you can say no to adultery, and you can say no to theft. You can say no to disobedience of any kind. You can be self-controlled. Self-controlled means no. And it means saying no to gluttony, no to um, drunkenness, no to um, anger and violence saying, no, I, I do not participate. I choose to, to not. It's amazing, that power that you've got. The, just think about all the world shoving at you that you need these clothes, this car, this vacation, you need this credit card, you need this kind of house, and you need all these drugs, and then you're going to be happy and healthy. Isn't it nice to say no? I am... Um, I was recently in a doctor's office, and the doctor's office is now part of a much larger health system, 
and that health system now requires that you go through page after page after page of do you do this, how do you do this, how many minutes do you do this, before you're even allowed to see the doctor. And I didn't know that, but I went in and they sent in the nurse who's a wonderful woman, an absolutely wonderful woman. And she sat down and she tried to get me to answer it. And I would say, no, well, no, no, you need to, uh, no. Because the questions were too private or they were asking me to quantify things that I wouldn't know how to quantify. You know, how many miles do you walk in a week? You know, I wear an old fashioned watch and I don't have an app to nag me because there are enough things that nag me in the world already. I don't need to add, I don't need to pay for a, a, a program and a watch to make sure I'm nagged more often. And I wouldn't quantify things. And I wasn't trying to be mean, I was trying to be very honest. We need to be able to say, no, I'm not gonna answer that question. No, no, I'm not gonna do that. Teaching yourself to say no. Think about our sports stars who are told they are wonderful from day one and showered with more money, $150 million for five years, that type of contract. And then we wonder, well, why did they get so much in trouble with all these making extra babies, uh, firearms issues, drugs issues? No, no one ever told them no. And nobody taught them how to say no. And I picked on sports stars, but we could pick almost anybody, couldn't we? No is an amazing word. By the way, that's the power of fasting. Don't want to get too far afield here. Uh, fasting is not a be all and end all. It is certainly not a command, but it is something that God expected. Jesus said, when you fast and said it, if you fast. Fasting is more complicated than not eating. Uh, because for most fast, it wasn't that. You didn't eat a certain food or you didn't eat during daylight hours. Um, Ramadan, for example, um, the Muslims will not eat or drink but it's during daylight hours. Uh, several years ago, Ramadan fell in the middle of one of Nashville's hottest summers. And I, my heart broke for my Muslim friends, some of whom were working building habitat for humanity houses in that incredible heat and not able to take a drink of water. Not until sunset and, and the evening prayers were said. You had to admire um, how faithful they were to their beliefs. But what is fasting for? I've seen all kinds of YouTube videos shoved at me that says it's for health and it's for this. And you know, there may be some health benefits to certain kinds of fast, but everyone I've seen has been wildly overstated. I think fasting gives you a chance to say no to yourself so that you can open your eyes and heart and hear what God needs you to do. And Isaiah, they were told, you're fasting, but I don't care, it's not helping, because a true fast is to pay your workers better, is to be kinder to the widows and the orphans and provide for them. It was, in other words, they weren't listening, they were just not eating. So fasting is just a way to learn to tell yourself no. It's a very valuable way, very powerful way. And he wraps this up, although he doesn't wrap it up in reality, the letter continues, but in this chapter, it finishes by saying, these then are the things you should teach. Encourage and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. Notice what is not in the chapter. That's all the things we argue about theologically. We argue about worship, about church organization, about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the ins and outs of all that relationship. We argue about all those things and none of that is involved in what Titus is to teach. It is behavior. Just as it is on the day of judgment when Jesus related what's going to happen there in Matthew 23, when he said, did you feed the hungry? Did you clothe the naked? Did you visit the people in prison? Did you care for those who had no power? It's behavior. Now, are we saved by works? No, we don't work so that we'll be saved. We are working because we are saved. We are free from the world. We can say no to ungodliness 
and yes to being present for Christ in every situation. So doing what is good, <clears throat> remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient and to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate and to show true humility toward all men. Uh, Paul talks a couple times about being uh, obedient to authority and we, when I was a boy, they would always say, now that's unless the authorities tell you to do something which is sinful and, and they were correct but they would always use the Soviet Union because that was the big bad monster when I was curling up, that we all knew the tanks were coming through the Fulda Gap, the missiles were coming over the Arctic, uh, and we knew you know, there would be nuclear winter. And um, as I'm recording this, about a month and a half, two months before you see it, Putin is threatening another one, but we don't know. I think sometimes we, we miss the point whenever we say, obey the authorities unless they tell you to do something which God didn't, we skip right past the obey the authorities. When I go on an airplane now, um, I have TSA pre-check, uh, so that helps a lot. But every so often, even though you have it, you don't have it, they randomly don't let you have it. And so to board a plane, you've got to raise your hands as if you're surrendering while the thing goes around you. I find that wrong on so many levels, but I do it. And I say hello and thank you to the TSA people. They didn't make this rule, wasn't their idea. They believe they're doing good and, and they probably are to some level. There are firearms found and not much, but considering the amount of foot traffic and most of those are accidental and so, but again, I'm not gonna, I, 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 I take out the water, you know, what's wrong? God, throw me water, what, what are you talking? No, these are the rules, we do the rules. I don't like it that some of my taxes go here, there, or the other place, but I have an accountant, because I'm no good at that kind of thing, to make sure that I pay my taxes, make sure I'm, I'm crystal clean in all of this. Somebody um, sends me a check and I'm looking at the check and I'm not really sure if it's to the church or to me, it's to the church. Why? Because you, you don't want to mess up your morality and a church's 501c3. You know, unless somebody says, hey, Patrick, we've been, you know, listening to you guys and we want you to have this money to go, I don't know. I don't get those checks. I have no idea what they would say. And I'm not asking. I'm not asking for them. I'm loved and I'm cared for. Thanks to, thanks to you. Um, I'm just trying to use illustrations and I'm falling on my face here. We need to obey the rules. Does that mean when you go 71 miles an hour in a 70 zone that you're sinning? No. Just try to stay with the flow of traffic. Try not to get, you know, if you did... If you went to Atlanta at 55, some of the times that they tell you to, you would cause death and injury. So I'm aware that these are not hard, fast things, but always try to follow the rules. And if somebody pulls you over and you say, well, I was afraid I'd be going too slow, it's not really much of a defense. You can say, yes, you had the right to pull me over. I was going over and you know, I'm sorry, but whatever you wish, that's what's gonna happen here, officer. Uh, it is the obedience to the rule that we don't like sometimes. And when I lived in Scotland, I had to pay the government for a license to watch television. You're not allowed just to watch television. You have to have a license and they, they, they check it. Did I think that was weird? Yeah. If I moved back to Scotland, would I do it again? Yeah. Why? It's a rule. So don't skip past that part. We need to not bring disrepute upon the name of Jesus by constant eye rolling, huffing, and attacking. In fact, it says to be all, to do this all in humility, and he, he reminds, to, reminds us of why. Um, there, Churchill had an enemy, Lady Astor, in the, uh, 
in a parliament, I believe in the House of Lords, regardless. Uh, and they, their exchanges have become legendary. And one time somebody trying to get Lady Esther to say something at least positive said, at least you must admit that he's a humble man. And she said something to the effect of, well, he has so much to be humble about. Well, Lady Astor and the universe at large, Patrick has a lot to be humble about. The number of mistakes I've made are legion and not proud of any of them. We should not made any of them, but it happened. So he says, why be humble? At one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures we lived in malice and envy. He just described Twitter. Being hated and hating one another. <laughs> that, that could be on the emblem for Twitter. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. Again, he loved us ahead of time. That's amazing. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. Once again, what was he told to do? to teach people to live well and live right, live in love and be self-controlled and self-disciplined. Not a word about organizations, how to take a Lord's Supper, what the rules are about prayer, none of that. Because everything we fight over and divide over and scream and yell and mark our territory over is left out of Christ speaking and Paul's instructions to Titus. Instead, love God, love your neighbor as yourself, behave like somebody who knows Jesus. And that's our job at our safe harbor. We are famously, some would say infamously, open. We don't care what religious tradition you've come from or if you stay in that. We have many active Catholics, Methodists, Presbyterians, Baptists. We have many of them who tune in every week and we welcome all of them and we fellowship them and we would serve them at, at the drop of a hat because they are people who belong to Jesus and who are loved by Jesus. We also have atheists and agnostics who tune in every week just to see what we're saying. Uh, so far, everyone that's reached out to me has been very kind and respectful, and we've been that way in return. Uh, and it's, it's been actually really good dialogues that have been coming out of that. Why do we do that? Because that's what we're told to do, not fight over how to do a worship service. So I think we got it wrong way back somewhere. Let's just get our Jesus back and do it right now. And it, he, he does bring up some negatives avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law because these are unprofitable and useless. Well, there he just shot down about 80% of Christian Twitter, Facebook, and colleges. Warn a divisive person once, then warn him a second time. After that, have nothing to do with him. You can be sure that <coughs> such a man is warped and sinful. He is self-condemned. Now, real quickly, because we're gonna wrap up this book. Didn't take long, did it? Timothy kind of helped uh, to get us ready for this. What's going on here? Early translations use that a divisive person and, uh, and they put down the word heretic. Well, the word heretic does mean a divider. Now, <clears throat> you and I can have different beliefs even about the Trinity, which I believe in the Trinity, but I have some friends that believe in variations of the Trinity that I don't believe in. And no, I'm not gonna state them because they're endlessly complex and we've just been told don't do that. But they're not heretic. I have friends who believe all kinds of things I don't believe, but they're not heretic. They're heretic if they say, 
I believe this, and if you don't believe this, then we have to divide because you're wrong and you're lost. That's heresy. And yet, that's what people do claiming they are protecting the church from heresy. Look it up in history. Every group that stood up to say, we're restoring a church here and we're gonna clear out the heretics became heretics by doing so and unleashed untold heresies upon the earth. We're not the divisive people. I have people that call me their enemy. That hurts me, I wish I didn't. But there's not a person on this earth that I call my enemy. I'm not gonna divide. And when I get to hateful letters, which aren't often, I don't wanna act like a martyr here. I'm, I'm so blessed, it's ridiculous. But when I do get hateful letters, I always just respond, I love you, and if you ever need me, please call me. I'll be the first to help you. And I mean it, that's all I can do. Because that's what we're called to be and do. We don't divide, we just don't. The final remarks, as soon as I send Artemis or Tychias to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis because I've decided to winter there. Do everything you can to help Zenus, the lawyer, and Apollos on their way and see they have everything they need. Our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good. There's Christianity. By the way, in the book of Acts, that's the biography of Jesus. One sentence, he went about doing good. All right, so in order that they may provide for daily necessities and not live unproductive lives, uh, unproductive lives. In other words, tell the people, work, be honorable, work for what you have. Everyone with me sends you greetings. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. And may grace be with you. Thank you for loving us so well, and we love you. Reach out to us. Send us an encouragement from time to time at info at rsafeharbor.com. With much love and great appreciation, I send you on the rest of your week. We'll see you next time. Cheers.